Christ is in our midst. He is. He is in our shall be. It's good to be back after a um, beautiful pilgrimage and conference, you know, a lot of busyness, but a lot of prayer. And that's what I want to talk about, because this gospel is precisely about prayer. Prayer. You know, there are some ways not to pray. <laughs> and this guy, he hit them all. Let's just boil it down just for us, for us, to this. When I am praying, I am exalting the Lord. That's it. Every other prayer comes out of that. Every other good quality prayer that's well-pleasing in the, in the breath of God contains us exalting and praising and worshiping and loving Him and not ourselves. Some prayers that we actually say, not in the church, but sometimes people pray and it's all about me. You know, it's all about us. It's all about how well we're doing or how, what, how well we want to be doing or what we want or some kind of a demand on the Lord. We're pretty arrogant, you know? Arrogant people who like to say, Lord. Now, there is in the history and in the scriptures and in the tradition of the church, some bold prayers, but that boldness, how can you say it? It's like a paradox. It's a boldness filled with humility. It's a boldness, a humble boldness that someone can stand up in front of the Lord and say, Lord, I am bold enough to ask you this question or to present to you this idea, knowing that I'm doing it with like fear and trembling and I'm in awe before you. That's not what you saw today. In this or heard in this gospel, from the Pharisee, from the from the from the one who stands up there in the front and says the first thing, I am so glad I'm not like other people. What a great prayer! I'm so glad I'm not like anybody else. You know, you have made me special, Lord. Now this is the exact opposite of how we pray. If you look at the structure of Orthodox prayers from top to bottom liturgical and private, you'll see that they always start with the praise of God. For instance, Thou who at every season and at all times in heaven and earth art worshipped and glorified. Da, 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 da. It's about God. Then only here, because of that, we ask Him for something. Right? Or, or the Jesus prayer itself, the, the most common prayer of the Orthodox Christian. The first is Lord Jesus Christ. It's Exaltation, you know, it's glorification, doxologia. And then, have mercy on me, it's only an afterthought. It's a good thought. And the Lord loves that thought. But He only loves that thought if we are offering it in sincerity and humility. Not, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. You know, like somehow you have to do that. It's your obligation, you're God, and you put me in this situation. And, you know, Outside of, outside of the tradition of the church, you see a little kind of haywire prayer going on with very strong, like I said, arrogance. Now compare that with our beloved Saint Seraphim. Do you know what his prayer was? It wasn't him first, it was him last. This is like the epitome of what a saint eventually comes to in their prayer. He said, Lord, let all my spiritual children enter paradise. Let all of them enter paradise before humble seraphim. He used to call himself humble seraphim, you know. Let them all go in front of me. And then, whatever you want to do with me is fine. If you think it's okay, I'll join them. If not, that's your God and I adore you. See, like, no matter what happens with me, no matter my situation and my, what I receive and all of that, Gifts are known. Or, I love you, Lord. Doxology. I praise you no matter what. I won't lose my mind if I can't get something. I won't lose my mind even, according to the humble seraphim, if I can't have paradise even. You're still God and I still love you. It's a very different approach to prayer, isn't it? I mean, 
It's a beautiful approach that I beg you to begin exploring, especially as Great Lent comes. You know, Great Lent is the time of times. It's the humility of humilities. If we're not going to learn humility during Great Lent, you'll never learn it through the year. You'll never learn it any other time. Because at that time, even in order to utter those prayers, to even open your mouth, you have to like humble yourself and say, O oh Lord, how about this one? The Lenten prayer of St. Ephraim. O oh Lord and Master of my life. See, first, doxology, praise. Master of my life. Now I can ask for anything. Why? Because I've humbled myself at the feet of the Master, at His throne. Right? You know, if we're going to be a little bit bold, we have to first be humble. I'll say it a different way. If we're going to be able to ask the Lord for absolutely anything, we have to be so close to Him in our lowliness, as He became close to us in His lowliness. It's powerful. So, Yeren de Frem, who just uh, reposed a couple years ago, he made, he made kind of a, a prayerful bargain with God. Can you imagine? Only someone who's very close to the Lord could do such a thing. He's because you know, like he didn't want to. He didn't really want to come to America back in the day. And um, one of his spiritual children in Greece told me this story direct. Said, you know, yet in the he uh, he didn't want to come to America, and he, he was talking to Christ in prayer, in prayer, like directly to Christ, like face to face. And he said, you know, I will go and start these monasteries and become, you know, abbot of the monasteries and run around all around America and all of this. One condition. One condition. Can you imagine a prayer like that to the master? But he was so humble. His whole life was humility. He said, if all of my spiritual children will be saved, I'll do it. What a bargain. Nothing for himself. Nothing for the Holy One, for the one who's very close to the Lord. It kind of rings of the same spirit that St. Seraphim had, doesn't it? I don't care about myself. I love my neighbor as myself. I love my children more than I love myself. I want them all to find paradise. Now, do you think that the Lord Jesus Christ is not very well pleased with a prayer like that? Like with a humble prayer that cares and loves the others first? that cares and hopes for their salvation and their closeness to God forever. This is our prayer. Okay, this is the way we pray. Not to gain a million things and for me, 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 me. Like, Lord, this one, I want to hold this one in my heart. They're struggling with me. They don't like me so much. Something I did to them yet. Put them right here and say, Lord, let's, let them be like joyful and peaceful. And let them have all the love, even if I get in the way. If I get in the way, please disregard that and move it out of the way. And let them have peace. This is the prayer for one's quote-unquote enemies. Which, of course, we have no enemies. Christians don't. They are our enemies. They choose to be our enemies. But we don't have enemies. How can you say you have an enemy when you're supposed to love your enemy? Pray for them. Put them in the deep places in your heart. Don't get in the way. Don't get in the way. Like, no one can take your prayer away. If, if you have struggles, so you're in the depth of some struggle, some depression, some mental illness, some, some spiritual darkness, like with oppression by the enemy, some attack from other people, persecution. You heard the epistle? If you live the life in Christ, guess what? It said directly, say, you will be persecuted. What does that mean to you? If I pray, if I love them, if I love Christ, guess what I can expect? I will be hated. I will be persecuted, maybe tortured, who knows what. But I certainly won't be loved and liked by the world, by those who don't care if I pray for them. They'll laugh. I heard at this conference I was just at, it was a beautiful um, reminder. This one um, administrator of an Orthodox school 
He was a very, very special person. He said, he said, now in the world, now the church and the world, the world doesn't even engage us. I'm talking about our church. They don't even notice us. It's like we don't exist. And instead of fighting with us and at least paying us some attention to attack and persecute, what they've done is just like this. Push us away and say, not important, not relevant. It'll dissolve. It'll disappear. It's a sad, it's a sad reality, you know, that we're not even noticed by anybody. So our job, right, is to, how can I say it the best? Speak for the Lord, love Him so much that we can actually use His words, have His mind, love with His love. Guess what? They'll notice us. I mean, we're still small, we're small. But they'll, they'll find us and they'll do a little mop-up operation with us, <laughs> that's for sure, no matter what that looks like. And that's a joy. That's a joy. Read the lives of your saints. Read the lives of of even the recent saints, the ones who just were like hunted down and hounded in the Soviet Union, in Romania, in Serbia, in Bulgaria, like in all those communist countries, and now even all those Middle Eastern countries where, where the Islam is, hates Christianity, hates it. So read, their, read the saints. Don't read the negativity of what the persecutions looked like. I mean, you've seen one, you've seen them all. There's no kind of imagination. They torture, they murder, they kill, and all the rest. Read what the saints did in those situations. And learn their prayers. Learn how they prayed in the midst of like, it didn't matter what was going on around them. Like St. Paul says, no one can take your prayer away from you, even if you're in a prison cell. Dark, underground, like so many of them were. They just kept the people underground. And then you hear the, the accounts of Pascha, like in the Jilava prison in Romania. They sing. They're singing Pascha by memory. The whole group. By memory. The whole Pascha Orthros. By memory. Because if you can't take that away. You can't take it away from your heart if you have the prayer. You see? If you have no prayer, then you will notice everything. You will feel every pain. You will struggle with every like slight word against you. Or how come they didn't notice me? Or how come this is happening and it's without me? And how come I'm like... It's so tiring. Isn't that exhausting? <laughs> I mean, when will we learn? I can have like paradise right here inside of me. It's good to go to the monasteries and to visit. It reminds me. Like when I'm there, it's like... There's nothing to do but pray. No activity, no business, no. There's nothing to do but pray. So why don't I just like leap in with both feet? I'm going to challenge you. First pre-Lenten Sunday today, publican and the Pharisee. I'm going to challenge you to have that same posture to some degree or another. I have nothing to do, but pray. Now it could take on different forms, obviously. A lot of the times it's just inside of you. Nobody in the world will even know you're doing it. Not even the people living with you. You could pray. And nobody's going to bother you with that. Unless you get in the way yourself. And then everybody will bother you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everything that they do will be an annoyance. Until you start praying. See? Lord, I have them here. Forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. There's something going on in their life. You know, maybe they had a big sorrow, a big sadness, a big trouble or something. Like, give everybody the benefit of the doubt in prayer. If you do it in prayer, you see it's triply sanctified because then God is blessing it. Not just you giving them the grace. God is giving them the grace. St. Paisius says, if you give somebody negative energy like judgmental thoughts, hurtful thoughts. It affects you. Don't you think? Don't you think it can harm you? But if you give them the, negative, uh, the positive thoughts, you give them some joy and some prayer, like all of you are together with Christ in your heart and 
you're praying. And nobody even has to know that. Like the person who just, you know, did something to you, bad. You put them right there and you say, they're with me. They are mine now. They are with you, Lord. You see, that affects you too, don't you think? But it also affects the other person. Whether positive or negative, whether blessed or cursed, cursed that thought is going to affect the other person, no matter what. They're going to do whatever they want with it, with the energy that comes to them. But you're offering something blessed to them, not something like mean-spirited and harmful. So it's a refreshing time now. We're not going to stand up here and say all the count all of our accolades and Lord, I'm this and that. And that guy, you know, the one in the back of the room, no good. I don't want to be like him. I don't want to be like him. I want to be like me. I am better. See, if you want to compare, <laughs> it's deadly, first of all. But if you want to compare with someone, why don't you compare with Christ? Let's do that. Say, okay, Lord, I am going to compare with you. And guess what? You will fall silent. Uh, I, am, I am utterly not like you. That's what you'll notice first. And that's like the beginning of prayer. When you notice that how beautiful Christ is, how light-filled, how radiant, how like amazing. And what you'll notice is if you take your gaze off that and look at yourself, you might shudder like this and say, oh, okay, I am not like him. Except if you acquire the grace over time because St. Seraphim... Again, I'll, I'll close with this image from St. Seraphim. In the conversation he had with his spiritual disciple, Multavilov, they were standing, remember, in the blizzard, like the snow was coming down, and Nicholas says to him, uh, what did he call him? Father, let's say, Father, you know, I, the uncreated light, I see you glowing. I see you like, as if you're looking at Christ. And Seraphim said, yes, yes, my son, and look at yourself. And he had enveloped him in the prayer. He had enveloped his spiritual son, Nicholas, in his prayer. And he said, and he said, Ooh. <laughs> and I too am glowing with the uncreated light. Just like to give us a glimpse. Sometimes you need a glimpse of the, in the spiritual life. And so that's enough to carry you through the, the entire life. And you could say, I know it's true because I experienced it. That's our church. I experienced it. I had some little glimpse of it. So I know, it's enough for me. And God gives you those graces, sometimes a little bit. Can you imagine? Nicholas Moldovilov had an amazing encounter. He was radiating with the uncreated light. Not from his own self. Through St. Seraphim, from the Lord Jesus Christ. The uncreated Christ came through him. Do you think that was enough to maybe change his life forever? Or at least redirect it in a certain direction. That is the ultimate place of prayer, right there. Prayer with these words of the Pharisee, no. The beginning of the real prayer is what the publican did. And we base our most simple, most commonly used, most frequent prayer on that tax collector saying, beating his breast and saying, Lord, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Lord, have mercy on me, over and over. And that's not what they call vain repetition. You know what that is? That's life-giving kind of breathing. Did you ever hear the word vain breathing? It doesn't. But you breathe all the time, in and out. And so how can Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on me be vain repetition? It's like your life. If I don't say that, even for those one, two, three, four, five, or 5,000 breaths, I'm dead. I'm a dead person. If it's not always in me, always like being generated somehow. Me paying attention to it or not, but knowing it's there, finding it again, finding it again. This is prayer. It sounds like a struggle. It's a struggle. But it's the only struggle worth pursuing. If you take that through this life, you know what will happen? You will take it into the next life. You'll be able to, like with these saints, these few that I've talked about, 
you'll be able to say to the Lord boldly, like, Lord, also, please, my family first, before me, I'm nothing. Lord, my students first, before me, my co-workers before me, the people who live in Bonner's Ferry before me, I could be last. There's no way to say that and mean it, like really have it in your heart, unless we have this simplicity, this kind of humble simplicity. And you'll know when, when that comes. Because you'll just, you won't parade it. You won't trumpet it. You'll just, you'll recede even more deeply into your heart with everyone you love. With all those you care about and those you don't care about. With all those that you know and those you don't know. Do you want to hear about the prayer of the church? The prayer of the church is enormous. It includes the whole world. No exceptions. And it includes like the infin infinitesimal Jesus prayer for me, who is a microcosm of the whole world, the whole church. If you can explore that, and we can work on it, you know, in confession or whatever you want to do, we could talk about you and what you, what's the next step in my spiritual prayer journey to find the living Christ within me. Sometimes it includes words. Many times it doesn't. My life has to be the prayer. I'll close with one story, short story, when, by, uh, from St. Onufrius. Do you know St. Onufrius? With the big beard to the floor? He's somewhere here. They wandered, you know, like he, he had his own disciples in the desert. And they wanted to learn prayer like because they knew they saw how this man lived and how he loved Christ and how he was like like amazingly transformed by Christ and they said please teach us to pray like you we see you pray teach us to pray like that and you know these saints they don't do exactly what you're expecting ever they're like Christ he never did what like what the Pharisees were expecting but he held up his hand and there was his hand and it was literally a torch. His hand was on fire. His hand was a flame. With the uncreated light of Christ. It was a flame. And they're, now what is this? Teach us to pray. You must become a flame. Your life, your body, your, your whole being has to become a flame. You have to literally become the prayer. How else to say it? If you are not the prayer, then the prayer is separated from you. Christ is separated from you. The other people that you're praying for are separated from you. When the tax collector goes into his bosom and says, have mercy on me. He's inviting the holy fire inside of himself and he becomes on fire. And the Lord says, this man is justified with that. Even if it's just a little beginning, a little kind of whisper in the back of the temple, you know, or in the synagogue. Just a little whisper, yet it has all the flame and warmth of God, of the Holy Spirit. Become a flame this Lent for yourself, for the people around you especially, and involve them all, like uh, invite them all into that flame. And you'll see like the whole world around you becoming illuminated. That's, the, that's what you're offered as an Orthodox Christian. That's your gift. And that's your Lenten gift, especially now, as we enter this holy period. Don't squander it. We'll, we'll, con we'll continue with the idea of squandering next week with the prodigal son. But this week, we, we focus on no squandering, enjoying the fire of God in our own hearts. Amen.